And um, thank everybody for joining in this morning. And uh, if we can, let's uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord Christ, as we come together again to study your word, God, we thank you for for this opportunity uh, to have this time to reflect together, to listen together, to share together. Lord, we, as always, ask for the inspiration and guidance of your Holy Spirit. We pray, God, that we would um, find comfort, that we would find challenge, that we would find hope in the words of Scripture today. Lord, we pray that we would find a word that you intend for us for the living of this day, this week, this month, this year. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these who are joining in this time of study, whether they're joining us live now as we record or God, those who, who watch the study later on. Thank you for their participation in this time and pray that you would bless each individual and each household as they, uh, as they join in this study together. Lord, now uh, speak to us as you will. We, listen, we lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I want to start by asking a question. Um, what are some classic proverbs that you have either been told or that you have used yourself? Now, when I say Proverbs, I'm not just talking strictly about the biblical book of Proverbs. I am talking about those adages, those well-known common phrases that we drop on one another uh, all the time. For example, I'll get, I, the example I use is an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Um, what are some of the, those classic Proverbs that either you find yourself using or being told quite frequently or that you have uh, repeated or had repeated to you over the years? Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. It takes one to know one. Takes one to know one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. My uh, my my grandfather used to always drop on us the the old a penny saved is a penny earned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he used to get that one quite a bit when I was a kid. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yep. All great men die early, and lately I haven't been feeling too well. <laughs> That was one I remember from high school. I apologize. <laughs> I, I did not like that one. It's not in the Bible. I like that one. I like that one. That's awesome. Oh. Why do these proverbs, I mean, why, why do we use these things? Why do we, why do these things catch on? Why do they get repeated so often and so frequently? I don't know, but it's scary. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> what were we saying, Barbara? I said they're so useful. Sometimes they just hit the nail right on the head. There's another one. <laughs> hit the nail on the head. There's another one right there. Yep, yep. So, yep. <clears throat> yeah, there's something about their conciseness, I think. Um, and, and because they're concise and because of the imagery, they kind of stick in our head. You know, they're easy to remember. Uh, you know, like I said, my grandfather, you know, rather than giving a 10-minute lecture on, on thriftiness, would just say a penny saved is a penny earned. And that was, you know, that, you know, 10-minute speech condensed to one little sentence. Um, so... Uh, I want us to, I, I asked the question today because as we as we're closing out our study of, of this letter of Paul, this first of First Thessalonians, this final section kind of contains well, I, I guess what we can only call a, a, a collection of of various moral teachings. And as we're gonna see, some of these teachings are framed kind of like some of these adages, some of these proverbs that we, that we talked about this morning. Um, in fact, some of the things that we're going to read today, you've probably heard at some point. 
Um, they, they're, they're words that perhaps have been repeated to you at, uh, at one time or another. Um, and the thing is, I, as, we, as we hear these things, oftentimes we, we kind of, again, kind of like with these other proverbs and adages, they, they kind of get remembered in isolation. But what I want us to pay attention to today as we kind of look at this final section of Paul's letter is how these various moral teachings, how some of these proverbs that, that Paul is going to use in his, in his letter are grounded in, in both the context of the example that Paul and his ministry team provided to the congregation at Thessalonica, um, but also how these proverbs are grounded in the content of the gospel message that we have seen and come to understand that Paul presented to the Thessalonians when he was with them. Um, and, uh, and I think it'll be, it, I want us to pay attention because I think it's important to, to understand that, that indeed these, these proverbs, while they were perhaps meant to be um, easily memorized, they were also meant to be connected to a, a much larger set of teachings and understandings um, that, 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 that could not be lost hold of. And, um, and that sometimes it's easy to kind of maybe even lose part of the lesson of the proverb if we just try to let it stand on its own and disconnect it from the larger context of Paul's presentation of the gospel through both his words, but also the testimony that he lived out. So, uh, so with that said, um, we're going to look at the we're going to look at the beginning of chapter four and the end of chapter five is what we're going to be talking about. And um, to start with, I'm just going to I'm going to read, and we're going to start by looking at the first eight verses of First Thessalonians four. And uh, I'm going to read these just to, for our hearing. I invite you to follow along. I'm going to be looking at uh, we're going to be reading First Thessalonians four, verses one through eight. Finally, brothers and sisters, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you learn from us how you ought to live and to please God, as in fact you are doing, you should do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that each one of you know how to control your own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, just as we have already told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God did not call us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever rejects this rejects not human authority, but God who also gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, the first thing I want to point out as we get into this first section is notice how, how Paul gets into this period of moral teaching. Um, he doesn't approach it from a standpoint of, let me tell you what you're not doing. Instead, and you look there at the beginning of, of chapter 4, what he says is, as you learn from us how you ought to live and to please God, you should do so more and more. And it's just, I think, an interesting note. I think a lot of times when we think about kind of a, maybe Paul, the ethicist, Paul, the moral teacher, we kind of imagine him as, as the, maybe the fire and brimstone preacher who's um, you know, calling down, you know, upon all you, you, you wretched sinners who aren't doing what you're supposed to do. But Paul is really taking a very different approach here. And, you know, he's not saying, let me point out what you're missing. Instead, he's almost taking the perspective of, hey, you guys are doing a good job. And what I'm telling you is, just keep, you know, keep, keep doing what you're doing and, and keep striving to do it better. Um, it, it's a little more of an encouraging tone than maybe a, a tone we might, he's not necessarily pointing out faults, so to speak, as he's saying, hey, keep building on what you're doing well. I just think it's kind of an interesting connotation. I think it impacts how we hear this passage 
if we hear it maybe more as a, as a tone of encouragement rather than a tone of criticism. Um, and so with that in mind, with this, you know, keep doing, you know, do, keep doing what you're doing, do it more and more. He launches into these ethical teachings. And, and to start with, he launches into kind of a series of teachings about sexual ethics, sexual behavior. And I guess the question I would ask is, why do you think this is where Paul starts? I mean, wh why of, of all the areas that Paul could start with in moral teachings, why does he start in this er area of, of, of sexual morality, do you think? Well, it's, a, such it's a... an area that's very personal, okay. and it touches lots of people okay. um, the temptations whether whether you actually sin the temptation comes to lots of people in lots of ways every day okay and all right so there so was that a, maybe why. maybe may, perhaps a, a, a recognizing a, a temptation that would be shall we say an experience shared by all mm -hmm. not not your particular group a certainly possibility and it may also be that that was a prevalent problem uh, in that day, in that area. So it was something that needed to be spoken to. We do know that there was, um, there was a sexuality was certainly an, an issue that was connected to the worship of other gods. And as we've said before, Thessalonica was a was a place where there were a number of there would have been a number of shall we say houses of worship of other gods and so um, it certainly seems you know we do get a sense here that Paul is is trying is talking about this from the standpoint he, he talks about a uh, in verse five uh, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God there's a sense of distinction and so. So it could be that Paul is, is trying to emphasize that this area of sexual morality is a place where, where the Christian church is to distinguish itself from the other faith communities, religious communities that were in the area. I think that's, that's certainly a, a, a part of what's going on here. Mark, Paul says, uh, avoid sinful actions. Contrast that with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he seems to say, avoid sinful thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, and uh, Dave, I'm glad you brought that up, because I think that this is a place where, it, we, we, I think, again, I, this is what I'm going to say, I think it's important that we kind of keep connected in here um, with the, um, with kind of the overall gospel message that Paul has given. Um, I think a lot of times um, what, what, we, what it, it, we have to keep in mind is when you look at that, um, that verse, I'm going to point to verse 8. Um, Therefore, whoever rejects this rejects not human authority, but God, who also gives his Holy Spirit to you. Uh, you know, also, you look it up, in, uh, up there in, in verse, five, for verse 3. This is the will of God, your sanctification. I think that one of the things, you know, I, I think very much, I, I think Paul really is trying to, um, it really is finding himself in line with the, the Sermon on the Mount teaching of Jesus, where Jesus really says, hey, you've been, you've been said, you know, don't do this, but I say to you, don't even hate a brother, you know. Um, you know, the law says thou shalt not murder, but I tell you, don't even be angry with a brother, where that, that sense of, of, of Jesus getting to the heart of a matter and not just the action of a matter. I think Paul is saying something similar, but I think the, where he's taking from it is, all right, look, Christ has, you know, because of Christ's death and resurrection, you have received the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Holy Spirit should be at work in you and leading you to right actions. And so, and so in other words, I think for Paul, the issue is because the Holy Spirit is within you, there is an inner transformation that should be producing 
righteous outward actions. And so I think there's, I think there, I, I, I do think there's a common theme that, that he, Paul's making, but Paul's taking it from the standpoint of Christ has done this. You have received the spirit. Now listen to the spirit and let the spirit transform you, you sanctify you from within. And that, and, and shall we say that sanctification should produce these fruits in what you do. So I think there's still that connection between, shall we say, the heart and the action. It's just Paul's couching it in his in a, in a post-resurrection, um, in a post-resurrection mindset. Whereas I think Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is is almost kind of saying, "Hey, look, you're you're this is what the law says, but this is what the really the deeper meaning of the law is really all about." Um, it's, it's a similar message, just coming at it from a little different perspective. Mark? Yeah. I, I also think that being holy is a process within the Christian life. Mm -hmm. Each day is different, and you have to check yourself each day. And the Holy Spirit um, works in us, conforming us to the image of Christ. Yes. So you ha it, it, it's, like I said, it's a process. We're only human. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Can and, I follow and, up on that? Sure. Go ahead. In verses one through three, Paul talks about our sanctification is God's will. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have an active role in that transformation, that sanctification, or do we wait for God through the Holy Spirit to transform us? Ooh, and if you say we have an active role, how do we avoid the temptation to try to earn salvation? Mm, that's a great question. And, mm -hmm. and Dave, I think that I think that because that that's a really interesting question when you consider. Uh, let's see, where where is it, where is it? I'm looking for. Um, uh, well, it'll it'll come later. There'll be a place where it, it must be in a, in a later verse. We'll, I'll, I'll come back. I'll come back to it later. But I think to answer your question. I think you, you have touched on what is truly, I think, and I'm going to try to maybe give the answer from what, how I interpret what Paul is saying. I think Paul is saying that, yes, we have an active role in, shall we say, allowing the Spirit to do the sanctifying work in us. We are to be a, a, a co-laborer, a co-worker with the Spirit. We're not to hinder the Spirit. Um, but I think that in giving that answer, I think that this is where we will see why Paul in other letters will so emphasize the idea that we are justified by faith alone. Um, it is because, shall we say, his teaching got taken to a point where it was a sense of you're trying to earn it. Um, you know, you look at letters like Galatians, um, and, and perhaps even, as, you know, in some of what he wrote in the, in the letter to the Romans, uh, was he perhaps trying to address uh, or, and correct a misunderstanding of what he was teaching? Um, I, I, think, I think indeed the temptation would be, I think it would be easy to say, oh, well, um, if, if sanctification comes in part through my, you know, and, you know if I'm a if I have a part in this, it becomes easy to think, okay, well, I'm, I, have to, I have to earn it. And you're back into that kind of law mindset, the uh, uh, Old Testament line, uh, mindset of I earn my salvation. I think Paul would be the first to say, no, we don't earn our salvation. Salvation is indeed a free gift. However, we are, there is a, 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 a part of, there is, there is a piece of this that does deal with, shall we say, our accountability. Um, and that in choosing to receive Christ's salvation, we are also making a choice to say, I will work with the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit. I will allow the Holy Spirit to be at work in me. Um, I think there's a, I, I think we're, where we're, you know, it's that sense of, you know, understanding salvation is more than just a get out of jail free card, or in this case, a get out of hell free card. 
there is an aspect, you know, there is a, a, a part of salvation that does involve a change in our life, and we have to be willing to allow that change to take place. We have to be willing to not only receive salvation, but to listen to the voice of Christ, listen to the will of Christ, and seek to follow and obey it. Um, but I, I think, Dave, you, you touch on, I think this is why we see in some of Paul's later letters, him stressing so much the idea of salvation and justification by faith alone, because I think that perhaps there was some who took took his teaching on sanctification and maybe took it a step farther than what he really intended. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but... Oh, yes. So. Good thinking. Would you say... Our active role is more of a responding to the Holy Spirit's initiatives. Yes. The Holy Spirit initiates within us, and we respond to that. Yes. Yes. I think very much so. Because I think I, I, and very much the idea is, is, shall we say, it is God who is setting the standard. And, and again, um, you know, I think all of this keeps coming back to the fact that, you know, you know what is holiness? Holiness is first and foremost that which is defined by God. Um, it is, and so, therefore, if, if I want to be holy, it's not about my following a human rule. It is first and foremost about me looking to God, looking to Christ, and, and finding the definition of holiness in Him. And so, so that, that idea of responding to the Holy Spirit puts the emphasis where it needs to be. I'm looking to God. I'm looking to Christ. And through his Holy Spirit, I am learning what holiness is and then choosing to follow that example. Yeah. Good question. Let me ask this question. There's a, there's a, a term that, that Paul uses in here that, um, that might be a little, uh, a little, little eye-catching to us. Uh, in verse uh, verse 6, um, actually I'm going to start with verse 5. Not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. Verse 6, an avenger. Anybody, anybody's translation read something different besides avenger? Mine just says, strongly warned you that the Lord will punish those who do that. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Anybody else have anything different? So does God actively punish sin in this life? I was going to say, so that's, that becomes the question. So, so what do you, what do you make of that? What's the... When, when Paul says that the Lord, you know, that the Lord is an avenger, that the Lord will punish all these things, what, what do you, what do you make of that, that sentence? Is Paul saying that the, the Lord will mete out consequences upon us for our sin here and now? It doesn't really say when. Um, yeah, interesting. There's no kind of timetable there, is there? <laughs> well, it just says he will punish. He is an avenger, but there's no sense of when that happens. So that flies, it, that ahead, flies in the face of why good things happen, why bad things happen to good people. Good people, I was gonna say. You know, there are consequences to our actions and the actions of others, mm -hmm. and sometimes those consequences are heaped upon our heads. Mm -hmm but I don't believe that it's actually God punishing us. I think he gives us free will and we have to accept the fact that there are consequences that we may not like. He's teaching us. He's teaching us. He's yeah. allowing those consequences to teach us. Right. Hebrews, Hebrews will, will very much pick up on that sense that, um, you know, this, you know, the idea of discipline, the idea of, in fact, uh, we're using that uh, passage from Hebrews in the, as a call to worship Sunday, um, that, 
that that the Lord disciplines us um, from the standpoint of of, of teaching us. Uh, is there is there a way that God uh, might wait until you stand before Him in heaven? Well, now there it, 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 that again, I think that's another very good question, Anne. Because again, going back to Vanjie's observation, there's not a a timing given. There's not a you know, mm. Paul doesn't. Paul at least seems to be leaving open the possibility that there could be, um, you know, is Paul leaving open the possibility that, shall we say, a, a judgment could come not in this life, but when we stand before Christ at his return? Or? Mm hmm Okay. But then we are forgiven, so how does that? connect um good question Mandy. how does that connect <laughs> I, I i think there is a part of me that wonders and again this is almost part of where sometimes you know, again i think we you know it's remind reminding ourselves that this letter that we're reading is the earliest of Paul's letters that we have. So this was written before Galatians and 1 Corinthians and, uh, you know, Romans, everything like that. And so sometimes I, you know, I wonder if, if in reading this, we're maybe seeing ideas just kind of introduced that Paul will spell out more completely in some of his later letters. Um, and there's a part of you, know, Paul will come back to this idea of the Lord as an avenger, so to speak, in Romans, where he will say, um, do not repay evil for evil, but overcome evil for good. And he says, because, you know, the, you know vengeance, and that's where the, the famous, the famous quote, the famous proverb, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Paul quotes that in Romans, but what his point there is, is God is the one who will mete out punishment and so, you know, uh, for wickedness. And so therefore, as, the, as, as Christians, it's not your job to get even with someone who commits evil. That's God's job to do. You are to repay evil for, with good. Let God be God. Let God be the judge. And so there's one sense in which I wonder here, especially in, 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 when you look at this in the context in which he's saying, verse 6, that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. In other words, is this Paul saying, hey, look, if someone breaks one of these rules, if someone commits adultery uh, with, you know, maybe even with another member of the congregation, don't, you know, this isn't a time to, to seek vengeance. Your job is, as, as, a, as a church member is not to seek vengeance on that church member. Instead, let the Lord be the judge of, the, of, of that person's sin. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, it's just kind of, you know, that, that will be kind of Paul's later, a, an idea that Paul will develop more fully later, but one wonders if there's not some echo of that teaching here when, in, in what Paul's talking about. Where does that fit in with uh, practice in some faiths of excommunicating either permanently or for a period of time? I think that's a great question. And I think, you know, the first thing to remember is that excommunication in its, in its original intent the purpose of excommunication was not to, was first and foremost not intended to punish the, the offender, but instead was seen as an act of protection for the rest of the, of the church community. In other words, this person is in sin, and so, for lack of a better say, you put this person out so that their sin does not threaten the faith or threaten the security of the rest of the community. Instead um, of bringing them back to God and being forgiven? Well, but, but, but let me, <laughs> but the rest of that story, Anne, is that, it, that, is that again, 
the original intent of excommunication was indeed, yes, you put them out of the community for the protection of the community, but then the, also there was, shall we say, a second, a second phase of the excommunication where indeed there was to be an attempt by the church to, to bring restoration to that individual who was excommunicated. Yeah. Um, you know, ex, you know, the purpose of excommunication was was meant as a shall we say it was meant as an act of, of discipline but the hope was that the church would continue to minister to that person to help them understand where they had gone wrong to help them correct their wrong so that they could be restored back to the community of faith okay now what happened was over time and in practice shall we say as with many things, some of that original intent got lost and it became much more about we're excommunicating you as punishment for what you have done. Um, and, and there was you know, that sense of continuing to try to minister and, and you know, restore a brother, as we see in Matthew uh, and Jesus talk about in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, you know, that was lost. Um, that sense of protection of the rest of the church, that was kind of lost. And it, it became solely about, we're doing this to punish you. Uh, we're going to cut you off from your access to the kingdom of God by doing this. And, and that really kind of got away from really what the original intent of a practice like excommunication was supposed to be about. Well, so from this, from this kind of first phase of, of moral teaching that kind of focuses on sexual ethics, Paul moves in a little different direction in the next couple of verses. Verses 9 through 11, Paul writes, Now concerning love of the brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anyone write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do love all the brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, beloved, to do so more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we directed you, so that you may, may behave properly toward outsiders and be dependent on no one. So here's my question. Throughout this letter, we have heard Paul praise the Thessalonian congregation for their love of Paul and his team, for their love of one another, so then why in this section of moral teaching does Paul return to this idea and say, we urge you, do so more and more? What, what's, what's Paul doing? He's been praising them all along for, you guys do this so well. Why is he now saying, we urge you, do this more and more? What's this all about? Hmm. Well, he didn't want them to let rest on their laurels or feel overconfident because he's praised them about how they love. He wanted them to, to continue to, he wanted to bring to their mind that they need to continue to do that. They couldn't be satisfied with where they are. If you think you got something figured out pretty good, you tend to not pay too much attention to it anymore, right? Um, you, tend to, you, you tend to kind of move on from it. And you slip back into old ways. And it which opens the door to, to just going, you know, eventually returning back to the things that you should. So there is very much, I think, a sense here in which Paul is, is saying, hey, look, just because you, you, you've been praised for this, just because you, 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 know, you, you know you're told that you do this well, doesn't mean you should take it for granted. You've got to continue to pay attention to it every day. Just because, you know, she, you know, a Amy's downstairs, so she can't argue with this one too easily. Just because I've been a fantastic husband for 25 years doesn't mean that I can say, oh, all right, starting tomorrow, I can just slack off. Um, you know, you know, now you, you got, you can't take it for granted. Uh, and Paul's saying the same thing. Hey, you guys love each other well. You've loved us well. We urge you, do it more and more. But also notice how in doing it more and more, the emphasis is changing a little bit. Look, look at verse, verse 11 again. I'm going to read the second half of verse 10 to start it. 
We urge you, beloved, to do so more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we directed you, so that you may behave properly toward outsiders and be dependent on no one. Notice how loving one another well and doing that more and more has now shifted from beyond how we relate to one another within the church to how we relate to those outside of the church. To love more and more is, to, is about behaving properly towards outsiders. We're witnesses. Exactly, exactly. Paul is, I think there's also a sense here, it's not only about don't take for granted what you do well, it's also about, hey, how does the way you treat one another impact the testimony that you're living out in the world beyond the church? Um, and, and, it, and I think there, that, that's an important connection to make here. Um, what do you make about Paul's instructions for, what do you make of these instructions in terms of relating to the outside world? living quietly, minding your own affairs, work with your hands. What, what do you make of those instructions? What's the... We truly followed those down through the ages. Would there have been an American Revolution? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Okay. We hold I mean, our, uh, self-evident that all men are created by, you know, all men are created equal, they're created by God. You know, yeah, one wonders... There's a whole lot of things. How do we know when to stop minding our own business and <laughs> oppose evil, injustice, uh, other things in society? Yeah. I mean, you think about it. Uh, the civil rights movement was, was, was started in large part within the context of the Christian church. Um, I mean, our, our concept of, you know, I mean, Dave, I'll, I'll, I'll use the idea, our concept of separation of church and state. It was Baptists who really primarily fleshed out what that looked like and argued vociferously for its inclusion as a, as a, as a fundamental understanding of how government in the United States needed to work. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, so... Is Paul saying we should just sit back and keep our mouth shut? Well, not to mention the admonition that we are to spread the good news to others. Uh, mm. That doesn't quite fit in here, except that Paul's saying, I guess you're spreading the good news by the way you live. I think, I think where, I think the connection that I would make is that a, a couple things to, to, to keep in mind. A, Paul was writing to a church that was truly a persecuted church. We go back to that Acts 17 passage. They were facing communal persecution. They were likely facing, shall we say, government-sponsored persecution. Um, so part of what Paul is arguing here is, hey, look, it, perhaps you know, your, your, your best testimony in the context in which you're in is not going to be a testimony of standing up and yelling and shouting at those who are in power and telling them why what they believe is wrong. Perhaps your best testimony is going to be living out the love of Christ through your words and actions and letting that world see what a Christ-like life looks like and let, and, and let the invitation to transformation come in that way. Um, you know, th this may have been, shall we say, a, a practical voice of Paul saying, hey, look, your witness can be much more effective if, the, if they see you living well 
if they see you living within community, if they see you loving each other and taking care of each other, then if you stand in the in the in the in the marketplace and and preach, uh, and that's going to get you thrown in prison where nobody's going to hear you. Um, so it could be that Paul is arguing for a method of evangelism that would be more effective in the community in which the Thessalonian church found itself. But I also think that there's a, there is a larger point here, which is that Paul is, I think, making a case, especially as we look at what we've seen so far, that a transformed life is a necessary component of a witness to the community. If you're getting up and saying a whole bunch of words, that's one thing. But if they're not seeing evidence of that transformation within the life of the individual and within the life of the community of the church, then really your witness is kind of hampered. Um, and so I think there's a sense in which there, Paul's also dealing with that. And I think the, the other point I'll point out is that, is that also, especially there, he brings this in verse 12, that you may behave properly toward outsiders and be dependent on no one. Again, we come back to that fact that the church, you know, this was a, 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 a community where there was a lot of, of worship of other gods. And a lot of the worship of, other, of those other gods involved festivals and feasts where business, where commerce would take place. And so there's an idea here in which Paul may have been saying to the Thessalonian church, hey, work with your own hands, be dependent commercially, economically on no one but yourselves so that you don't have to compromise your beliefs in order to be able to provide for your family, in order to be able to provide economically for your community. Um, you know, this, we, we see this idea in, in some cases today where some, some folks have a mindset that they will, only, um, they will only visit, only use businesses that they know are owned and operated by Christian business owners. Uh, and this is a verse that they point to and say, hey, look, I want, to, I want to help my Christian brothers and sisters. In the Thessalonian case, that would have been very important because Christian businesses, Christian merchants, uh, were probably lost business because they identified themselves as Christian. Um, because they were seen as a, as a threat to the community, there were probably consequences, economic consequences. And so Paul's saying, hey, look, do what you can to support your brothers and sisters to make sure they have the means to be able to provide for their families. That's part of what it means to love one another. So just a couple of different items, thoughts of what could be going on here. Does it suggest that maybe living a Christian life is difficult sometimes, and maybe we really do need to depend on the guidance of the Holy Spirit and how to respond? Do we stand up and be counted, or do we live quietly and mind our own business? I think this is where, um, yeah, I mean, I think there, there's a little bit of that. And, I, and, I, and, you know, obviously, I mean, here's Paul who, you know, we, as you know, I mean, Paul, who got chased out of Philippi, got ch chased out of Thessalonica, <laughs> you know, was regularly getting out of, chased out of places for standing up and, and preaching. Um, so one might say, hey, Paul, why, you know, why didn't you practice what you preached? <laughs> um, you didn't sit quietly. You didn't mind your own business. Um, but again, I do think that, that part of it, I, I do think there, shall we say, there's a discerning eye and a discerning ear here. Um, that Paul is calling the church to. And part of that discernment is, yes, listening to the Holy Spirit. There's a time to speak, but also making sure that if you're going to speak, make sure that you are speaking, I guess for like I said, speaking out of a place of love for your community, but also love for those outside of your community. Um, you know, if, you know, and not in, in anger, not in resentment, not in hatred for your community, you know, don't stand up and say, hey, y'all are all going to hell, and I'm glad you are, um, but it's, you know, instead, it's, it's the message of, hey, we love you. You are our neighbors, and we love you, and so, therefore, we want to share this word with you because we love you. Um, I, it, there's a very different tone that comes from that kind of, when you're approaching it from that kind of mindset. I think that's where the, 
do so more and more. Love one another, and that includes loving your community that doesn't always like you. And sometimes you've got to respond to that by just minding your own business, but there are times where indeed to love your community means to speak, means to, 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 to speak out, but do so in a spirit of love and not in hatred. Well, let's 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 get to the the, the last part of chapter five here, and, and the last kind of series of of, uh, of teachings that Paul drops on the on the Thessalonians here. Um, I'm going to be looking at chapter five, verses twelve through twenty eight. Um, and and again, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot, and, and but there's also a lot in here that's probably going to be familiar uh, you, that you've heard before. First uh, Thessalonians five, beginning with verse twelve. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you. Esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Beloved, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I solemnly command you by the Lord that this letter be read to all of them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, I'll be honest, I kind of had to laugh when I was reading this passage this week, and I got to that verse 26, about greeting all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. Um, and I thought, man, what a weird verse to read in a COVID world. So <laughs> uh, just, just, a, just an odd concept to think about. So what stands out to you about this kind of last blast of teachings that Paul gives to the Thessalonian church? What, what stands out to you from, from, from this last section? Well, you got verses 19 through 22. To me, it's saying avoid uh, tempting situations and concentrate on obeying God. Mm. 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 But yet 14 through 15 is, is really very positive about here are the things you can do for your fellow man. Mm-hmm. 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 Encourage them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Be patient with all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't see that one on bumper stickers very much, but boy, that could make a really good bumper sticker. Um, Wouldn't it? Though? <laughs> well, in the last verse, uh, try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Uh, there's a verse very similar to that in Ephesians. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ephesians verse one of the first memory verses I ever learned at my grandmother's knee. Uh, be ye kind to one another. Uh, yeah. So yeah. That, yeah. That was the thing for Paul in a lot of places. Well, and, and I said verse 15, see that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and all. You hear that almost, almost that exact same thing from Paul in Romans. Mm -hmm. um, almost word for word. How about in uh, verse 12 there, where he says, uh, respect, is he saying respect servants, those who labor, and masters, those who have charge and admonish you? Or is he talking about laymen versus ministers? That's a, or, And ministers. I, I think it is, it is probably more the second um, 
in, in, in respect, especially, um, I, I think this is a reference. Um, I think Paul here is talking about, you know, I think he's certainly talking about those who are charged with the responsibility of teaching uh, to the, the people and leading them. But I think he uses, I think the fact that he uses that word labor um, really does expand the, the context of who he's talking to. It's not just the, shall we say, the teachers and the preachers. It is indeed all who work among you. Um, and so it is, shall we, for lack of a better way of saying it, it is indeed lay, you know, the lay people, but you know, the distinction we might make in our current church settings today, the laity and the ministers. Um, you know, to, 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 to have respect uh, for, you know, and I think it, it, it's kind of that, uh, you know, there's that sense throughout, you know, throughout, you know, in, in the following verses, be patient with all of them, seek to do good to one another and to all. Um, you know, there's this sense of, of um, you know, in verse 27, even, command you by the Lord, this letter be read to all of them. There's this sense of trying to incorporate the entirety of the body of Christ, the entirety of the church. And so I do think it's meant as a, as a, a command regarding, you know, kind of going back to how to live as the church. Uh, hey, Mark, yeah. can, I can I read you what my Bible says? Sure. It says, dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peacefully with each other. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's definitely a sense of, of, of uh, I think it's definitely talking about, the, shall we say, the leaders within the church. But I do think there's a sense in which it, 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 it is, I think there is a sense in which it does it, it is meant to be understood, at least in part, about a reference to all within the church. Um, that, that last sentence, and I find it interesting, and in your translation, it mm -hmm. takes that be at peace with one another and connects it as part of that whole idea. Right. Um, my translation takes that sentence, be at peace among your, basically makes it its own sentence um, as, as if it's either a separate or a new idea. Okay. Um, but I think your translation maybe really does capture more the sense of what Paul's saying here, that to be at peace amongst yourselves is indeed, it, it's related to everything that Paul's just said in those last couple of verses. Yeah, I, I, want, I want to point out, especially verses 23 through 24, because I think this is kind of where, you know, they always say, um, you know, a good speaker uh, is, you know, tells you what they're going to tell you, then tells you, and then tells you what they told you. Um, <laughs> and verse 23, 24 is, is I think, Paul, uh, that's his, uh, I'm going to tell you what I told you, uh, <laughs> uh, part of the letter. Um, because really, truly, this is where we see these ideas and some of the, the, the really main ideas that have been the undercurrent of this entire letter kind of summarized. Um, may the God of, of peace himself sanctify you entirely. This idea that God is at work transforming you from within and that impacts your, your outward life. And that sanctification begins with, you know, with, with God's act in Christ in his death and resurrection. Um, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of the Lord. There is a work that has, that has already been done but there is still a work that we are, shall we say, there is something we are waiting for. And that our waiting is not just a sitting around idly and doing nothing, but our waiting is preparing to receive Christ, but also living out the life that Christ has revealed in his life, death, and resurrection, and that will be revealed in his second coming. Um, and then verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. We go back to the kind of the beginning of the letter where, you know, Paul was reminding the Thessalonians, say, hey, look, no things are tough. No things are hard. No things aren't maybe as perfect as what you thought. But know this, that the Lord is faithful to his promise, and he will do what he has said. 
that faithfulness is um, is revealed in his in, in what he done in resurrecting Christ, and it will be revealed when he returns. And so the Lord is faithful. So you also be faithful as you have already done. Um, and so some of the key themes, the key ideas that have kind of been the underpinnings of this whole letter, Paul kind of comes back to one final time, summarizes it, and kind of brings it all home. This is kind of what this has all been about. Do you think that sort of reinforces the, the idea we talked about earlier, that it is God who is doing the changing? Yes. 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 I think that's exactly it. And I, and I think that's what's, and I think that's why, you know, kind of to kind of come back to, to a point that I, I kind of touched on earlier. Yeah, you know, like I said, it's, it's kind of easy to take some of the, the, these ethical teachings, these ethical ideas, and, and, and again, kind of bumper sticker. Um, you know, I've seen t-shirts that say rejoice always, um, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Um, you know, I mean, we, 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 we've kind of bumper stickered some of the ideas, some of the teachings that Paul is saying here. But, and while by doing that, there's certainly good ideas, um, you know, and, 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 and they're good things to do, but I think if we take them out of the greater context of the, the theological underpinnings of what Paul is saying here, we do lose something. Yes, we're to rejoice always and pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. Yes, we're always to seek to do good to one another and all. But it's not just because those are good ideas. We're to do that because that is, shall we say, that is what the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit within our lives should be producing. Um, it, you know, it, it, we can't separate these actions from the idea that Christ has already has already brought salvation, has already begun the work of sanctification through the Holy Spirit. And part of what it means to be a Christian is to let the Holy Spirit continue that work. And this is the manifestation of that work in us. Um, and, and so it is not, shall we say, Paul calling us to a legalism of, here's the things you got to do because I said so. It is truly based in an idea of this is what God's work in us should be bringing out. Um, and so I think, you know, we can't separate the, if we, if we, kind of break these ideas off from that underlying theology, we do run the risk of, of, a, of kind of reverting back to a legalism that we'll see Paul in other letters rail against. Um, it has to be established in that foundational gospel story. Um, and so I think when we, when we look at these, this, this section of Paul's letter, um, it's important that we keep that foundation in place, um, that we let that be established. Um, because then I think it's only then that we can truly understand really what Paul is trying to get across to the Thessalonian church. Um, so, um, well, we are, we're at an hour, and uh, I, we started a little late today, so I, I took a couple extra minutes. Um, but, uh, but thank you all for, uh, for, for being patient. Thank you all for participating. Uh, thank I really you. Appreciate, um, appreciate that you all have been a part of this, and uh, uh, this has been fun. I know this has been a little different setting and context for doing Bible study. Um, but I hope it's been a meaningful experience and uh, I really appreciate y'all being a part of it. So, And I hope we can do it again soon.